strikes me that, that this is a man who is he loves to go into soliloquies or he loves to make judgments about other people. I thought the spitting on the windshield was much better. That girl's not pregnant. What's that? That girl's not pregnant. I, I don't think the author followed up on that to show us what, what he was hiding from. Why was he hiding? Something serious was going on. The author felt something serious was going on. Ugly things. The poetry of ugly things. She, she was just for him something that didn't quite work. about 20 years, they've been writing in these temporary barracks in Iowa City, Iowa. There's no telling how many millions of words have been set down in and around these buildings. Words that have been torn apart, analyzed, examined, and reformed. In this workshop for writing, people who care learn about the craft of writing from some of the best people in America. On the campus of the University of Iowa, under Philip Roth, author of Goodbye Columbus, under the poets Robert Lowell, Paul Engel, under R.V. Castle, author of Clem Anderson and Pretty Leslie, they have worked on their own technique as writers, under Nelson Algren, author of The Man with the Golden Arm, and under Vance Borgelli, author of Confessions of a Spent Youth, and under Kurt Vonnegut, author of The Cat's Cradle, they study today. Marguerite Young, author of Miss McIntosh, My Darling, and the Pulitzer Prize winning poet W.D. Snodgrass have both studied and taught at the University of Iowa Writers' Workshop. Richard Kim, author of the bestseller The Martyred, is an alumnus. Students in the workshop have fought out their techniques, ideas, and experiments, and as one student said, have learned as much here in one year as could be learned in 10 years of solid writing. More than 100 books. People whose imaginations have been stimulated by their work. and by their environment. In the local gathering places, they talk of Hemingway, Faulkner, Thomas Mann, Flaubert, Joyce, Saloni, Rilke, and Lowell. And like nearly everybody else, of course, they have the deluge of the mass media to help them keep up with the times. This is an environment of work, of play, of contact with life in many of its forms, stimulating to the writer as craftsman, as intellect, and as sensibility. This is Vance Borgeli, novelist and essayist. He has been described as an expressionist and a romantic. His prose is rich in imagery. It deals with the loss of individual dignity and shows a Dostoyevskyan sense of inner psychological workings of the human personality. It sounds like this. I was always a tourist in the worlds of your world and never found the one in which I could belong until I learned to make my own. He teaches fiction at the Iowa workshop. R.V. Castle, on the other hand, belongs in the literary tradition, moralistic, controlled, his short stories and novels have a meticulous craftsmanship, which has been described as Mandarin. He wrote this. The flags of every country were up in the early morning breeze, and on their rippling fields twinkled the mysterious symbols of authority and fidelity. Stars, crescents, crests, hammers and sickles, heraldic beasts, and the proud gold lilies of the forgotten wars. From their staffs over the national pavilions, the ultramarine and lemon and scarlet pennants, 
streamed out like dyes leaking into an oceanic current. It was only the empty sky that watched us, but my God, my God, how the drums thundered, how we blew. Castle has taught at the Iowa workshop and will be back next year. Baudelaire, whose words could teach, song to the birds, lost power of speech. Through nights loud with the drunkard's shrieks, evil kissed him on both cheeks. Pelican in his stinking nest bit bleeding poems from his live breast. Written by the poet Paul Engel, director of the Iowa Workshop. The program in creative writing at the University of Iowa, better known as the Writer's Workshop, has caused the University of Iowa to be described by the Saturday Review as the most important campus in the American literary establishment. If it is the most important campus, much of the credit should go to Paul Engel, professor of English and director of the program in creative writing, who founded the program at the University of Iowa 24 years ago. Today, Mr. Engel is with Vance Borgeli, who is director of the program in fiction in the Iowa Writers' Workshop, and R.V. Castle, formerly at the workshop and now at Purdue. From time to time, each of us has encountered the well-meaning question, can you really teach someone how to write fiction? Obviously, each of us has given some sort of affirmative answer to that because we've been trying to do it for so long. But I suppose we've been changing our mind in the light of experience and updating our opinions. And I wonder how you'd answer that question today, Paul. I'm sure that none of us believes that we can teach any person to write. We do, however, feel that a writer can be taught a few things. He can be taught to become a better writer more quickly. I think, Paul, that may imply that what we do as teachers has more importance than I think, in fact, it has. It seems to me that for the students who come out to Iowa, a lot of the important learning they do is learning they, do, they get from one another. In their informal sessions and the group discussions of manuscripts and things well, like this. The Bear Tavern sessions and all that kind of thing. Sure. What we've done in Iowa City is to create a, an atmosphere, a place in which a lot of young writers can come together and interact with older writers. And it's, it's not, strictly speaking, a teaching kind of function that I feel. That, uh, yes. Well, we know that uh, in times past, uh, younger writers have learned from older, more experienced ones. Uh, in the case of people like Ezra Pound or Ford Maddox Ford, uh, editors and writers have uh, valuably coached young people who are, are trying to learn s something about their craft. But I suppose the question which logically follows the first one I mentioned is, why is it desirable to uh, bring such a teaching relationship into a university rather than uh, leaving it in the publishing centers of the world? Ad admitting uh, that, surely, for certain writers, universities might well be deaf. Uh, it's not for everyone. Nevertheless, <clears throat> as you said, the young writer has always met the older writer if he, if he could and has been guided. And guiding rather than teaching, I suppose, is what we do. And a young writer in a country of the size of the United States needs a place to go often. If he comes to Iowa City, he knows that he will meet with writers and that they will discuss his writing. And in a sense, we have it there available uh, in advance. It is not left to chance. But what would happen if you found that the rather quiet environment of Iowa City and the um, academic routine to which the student is somewhat exposed uh, was becoming deathly for the writer? Uh, what? what do you do in a case like that? Well, I don't think we do anything. I think, as happens with every good educational process, the young writer is impelled to do something for himself. And <laughs> very often, this will simply be get out of Iowa City mm -hmm. and uh, perhaps going, go away harboring a certain resentment against it and the workshop and what goes on there. But that's all right. If you're going to rebel, you have to have something to rebel against. And I don't mind being something to rebel against. Well, isn't it also fair to say that the relation of the 
teacher to the student in the workshop is, is close enough so that uh, uh, we're, we're aware of temperamental and personal problems as well as uh, uh, those of craft. Writing, but, you know, uh, unavoidably reveals a man. And so in the teaching of writing, uh, we learn a great deal more by reading the stories and the poems than, say, uh, the teacher of history would learn by reading an essay on the French Revolution about the individual. And very often a man may actually feel uh, Iowa City is too confining for him, uh, in particular if he doesn't have the taste to enjoy the uh, extraordinary amount of music and painting and printmaking and theater that goes on there. But as a community, which Vance has mentioned, we have a certain uh, value in allowing these people a chance to find an identity. Would you say the, the uh, teacher of writing is distinguished perhaps from other teachers in that he uh, uh, teaches a person rather than a subject, that, that uh, he engages with the uh, immediate living problems of a writer who is engaged with the same thing rather than um, trying to give him a discipline and a, uh, and a background of reading in the tradition of literature? Let, let me go back on the other side of the fence because I think we're all agreeing too lavishly that the teaching is unimportant. I think there is a good deal of teaching of technique, which we do, which I would like to think is closer to the studio training that painters have always gotten from, you know, a, an older and more established painter in a studio or sculptors have always gotten. I think we do a certain amount of that kind of studio teaching at Iowa, and we do it as hard as we can, and it gets some results with certain people. Well, Paul, uh, what about the value of the uh, academic courses or the courses in reading and criticism of literature that go with the, the time spent in actual writing classes? I consider well, what's these, the place of that? I consider these extremely important. There are technical things, as Vance says, that you can teach. In fact, we believe in this so uh, firmly that we actually have a correspondence course in which you don't meet the student. However, the writing workshops exist within a circle of supporting courses. Uh, these courses are critical views of the development of the modern novel and, and the modern poem. Uh, they are courses in the intensive reading uh, of a single modern novelist or traditional novelist. So that it seems to me that uh, ignorance uh, is no great virtue, uh, even for a writer. But uh, there, there might be such a thing as, as a burden of, uh, of knowledge which would keep him uh, uh, isolated from the tempo or the spirit of his times. Is, is that not uh, I think the uh, university actually does sometimes keep reality at too great a distance. I think this is one of the dangers of what we do. Nevertheless, I consider that the writer is a very tough-minded uh, person, or he wouldn't uh, be Should so foolish as to want to be a writer, <laughs> you know. And so um, he's not going to be killed by being in the university any more than he is going to be made a writer um, by uh, living in the slums or uh, uh, going out to sea on a freighter. Uh, Eating regularly is not going to kill him any more than going hungry is going to, to, to make him a writer. I find that I can get very irritated by the use of the university as a general term, as if all universities were the same and would affect people in exactly the same way. It seems to me that Yale is a very different place from Berkeley, which in turn is a very different place from Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine, where I went to school. The University of Iowa is a very specific place. It has a very specific natural setting and there's some non-academic learning that goes on for a metropolitan kid for example who comes to Iowa City and finds for the first time that it's fun to buy a shotgun and walk around the fields and try to shoot pheasants and that kind of thing which they'd never do if they didn't come out. Of course we're, we're in a changing time here and universities which have followed one pattern may be veering off on new courses and the whole question of the writer on the campus is a one that that is being constantly agitated, I suppose, ought to be. Vance, you and I have both um, taught seminars in contemporary fiction that, that go along with the sections in writing, the group discussions that, that we have on student manuscripts. Do you find uh, that there is a close connection between the uh, 
the discussions you have with your students in the Joyce seminar or the Proust seminar that you teach and the uh, discussions of their own work. Do you get a vocabulary from the one uh, that, that carries over into the other? I don't guess I've ever thought about it, so I don't have a ready answer. Have you thought about that, Paul? My feeling is that there is an immediate carryover. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, when, uh, for example, students have been taught intensively for a whole semester, uh, let us say, uh, all of the remembrance of things past, uh, I'm absolutely convinced that a certain percentage will, uh, in the following semester, begin introducing that sort of deliberate enriching recollection of experience, which is Proust, into their own stories. Well, I found in talking individually with students in individual conferences that one of the most valuable pointers I can give is a, a suggestion as to something they might go and read. Now, we've talked about the, uh, the workshop method of individual conferences and, and uh, group discussions of student work. Now, I imagine for most people, it's easier for them to grasp the kind of, of value that would come from the individual conferences than it is to imagine the hurly-burly and the give and take and the, the emergence of uh, clarifications that uh, come out of a group session. Well, I think to explain it, you would have to explain what we do. Well, in advance of the class, we distribute a piece of student work in mimeographed form so that they've all read it before the class starts. And when the class starts, a discussion is perhaps all ready to go. We're going to talk about a story called The Judas Goat. It's the story of Harry Kravick, a plumber's son, much burdened by the dependence on him of his widowed mother, his aunt, his pregnant wife, and infant daughter. Harry sees his life in terms of survival. All these women are trying to crush him as they did his father. Then he meets Stanley, an aging bachelor, and craftily introduces Stanley into the household to take the heat off. Roger, what do you take the theme of the story to be? Well, I think the story is about the way women want men to be men on a woman's terms, terms which, uh, if obeyed or accepted, make men not men at all. Suzanne, do you agree with that? <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, I think all the way through this, he's, Stanley is a, a, well, he, first of all, he's very afraid, of course, that is the reason behind his, his, everything in the story, but he, he's very selfish all the way through that. He is running away from these women. He's not considering their needs at all. He is married, and he does have a mother, and that does, that does assume a, a certain amount of responsibility. They, they probably feel a certain amount of responsibility for him. But uh, they have no. killed his father. <laughs> no, but Suzanne, you have to take the story in the terms that it's presented here, and I think it's presented from the hero's point of view, and I think from that point of view, then we have to say that these women are after him. It's a story of, of the chase, and these women are, are, are after his skin, and he's trying to escape the best way that he can. But if he, if he were already at the beginning, it said, there's a, the, in the third paragraph it says, other women that came to his father's funeral would look at him, and, and, and he was afraid already. Well, why would they have to look at him? They, he sh they shouldn't even have to worry about him playing his, his part. <laughs> he should just obey automatically. No, no, not no, obey. No, no. One, one, no, because one at a time. There are <laughs> John Casey. No, there, are, he, there, there are three of them. There is his fat wife, his fat mother, and his fat aunt. All of them oh, no. go out, take in sewing, and make a little money. And there's <coughs> one poor man who's got to support three of them and then four as soon as she gets pregnant again, which she then, then, then claims, it's your fault, it's your fault. I mean, it's, it's just, he's really hemmed it in and persecuted on, 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 on all sides. And they're like, like, like huge crows pecking uh, at, his, <laughs> at his vital part. It's just terrible. Let's see what well, if, you. if the story is written from uh, the man's point of view, I'm afraid the whole thing is too black and white. Yeah. There are uh, four women on one side and one man on the other side. And all the uh, four women have the same voice, same thought. They, all of them say, Harry, you ain't no kid no more, Harry. You got responsibilities, you know. As a woman, I know how women are. If you have four women around, there would be much more trouble, more confusion. <laughs> <laughs> I got a good... This can't be that simple. 
I've got to give the men equal time. <laughs> John, Penny? Well, I, I don't think there's any doubt that the author sees the story from Harry's point of view. And he sees Harry is persecuted. And Harry goes out, and he goes to the employment office. And the author intends for something to be happening there which is going to change his relationship with these women. Uh, my uh, disagreement with the story comes from, uh, from what happens. He runs into this character, Stanley. And my impression was that he was going to learn something. Stanley was going to teach him, and he was going to come back and in some way assume ascendancy. But instead, what happens is he runs away from Stanley in the street for reasons which are very unclear, doesn't see him for weeks, and then weeks later, seeks him out, and a strange idea comes into his head, something about bringing Stanley into the house to take his place or trading places with Stanley. This uh, seems to me... Share the load. This seems to me unprepared for in terms of the story. It seems like a gothic ending tacked on. Uh, this is my chief argument with the story. But I, I one one short point to, to come to you on page on page six. Uh, it does say why he he, he runs from yeah. From, yeah. from Stanley, yeah. and he runs from him for the same reasons that that the Harry is running from from the, with the women. He understood for this man Stanley favors linked to favors like clouds to rain, cocoons to butterflies, fathers to their sons, an unending cycle of involvement and dependency. This is the, this is the author's reason. But does a man who needs a job stay away from the employment office for weeks to avoid a guy who merely asks to look at his newspaper? I think well, that... He senses more than that, though. I mean, it's, 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 it's an intuitive thing. Well, Tom? that's the author's idea. <laughs> I think the main thing you have to keep in mind is that it's, it's a humorous, very light story. And I, I don't know if it's, uh, it's, it's meant to, uh, <laughs> to, to be taken... Uh, as an intensely intellectual working out of a problem, it, it's done, as they say, from the hero's viewpoint, and he sees all he bunches all women together because he has this uh, attitude. And uh, I, th I thought it was handled very well, simply as an amusing, entertaining story. I don't know if there's really meant to be it. Well, I think the story struck me as being much more grim than that. I thought that uh, what was good about the story, and in the point in which I differ with you, is that it was not a kinetic story. You were given the conditions at the outset that his father had been hounded by these women. Uh, these women were there together. Uh, Harry was crushed by them. And the fascination of the story is that here is this one moment after his father's death where there might be a chance that Harry will do something. But, but the conditions are very clearly stated. And, and because it's, the odds are so heavy against Harry, you are interested in seeing whether he will uh, get out of it somehow. And the ending, I think, is uh, I didn't get anything too intellectual about it. And I'm confused uh, a little bit by the subtlety of some of the interpretations, for instance, I was not clear at all why Harry brought Stanley home until uh, someone else had mentioned it to me. Lorraine? Well, I uh, want to get back to the point of view of the story. I think that uh, it is told from the point of view of a person with, who is limited. And, uh, I mean, it is true to itself all the way through. I don't happen to agree with the uh, thesis that he takes that, uh, that this is a reasonable reaction. Uh, of this man. This man is somebody who has been cowed by women, but at the same time, he is a man with a responsibility well, and is afraid of it. Yeah, it seems to me that you and Suzanne both though, are, are trying to say that the author, uh, there's no distance between the author's viewpoint of this and the characters, that there's no irony in the story. Do you feel that way about it? No, I, I don't feel that way, actually. Uh, um, I think he is, he's shown well, he's made the story so that it's ambiguous enough so that we can argue about it. Let's put it that way. So he has to, he, he can't be on completely one side. <clears throat> Isn't irony always ambiguous? Yes, that's what I'm saying, yes. So I think it is ironic to a certain extent, but I don't think, I don't think you can view it from, from Stanley's point of view, from just a man's point of view at all. There's, there's much more to it. He that's, is that's irresponsible. That's the way it was written. <laughs> no. uh, I'd like to take uh, um, argument with this idea that it's a, a humorous or a grim story, it's neither one, it's a comic story. And comic doesn't always mean yawks and funnies. Uh, and this, this is a comic story, and, and it should not be considered as a grim one. Finally, what the author does in the end is pull a, the pull a rug out from under Harry, I think. Uh, because he, he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't commend this as, as responsible action. He does it. He says nothing about it. That's why the story stops and has to stop where it does. And this uh, makes, you know, the, the, gives the author the chance not to make a judgment, to give you Harry, and that's part of comedy. Mm -hmm. John? Whether it's explained as, as a comic or whatever kind of a story, can you tell me how it's going to work that uh, 
this guy Stanley is going to come into the home and they're going to switch places or something. Exactly what is going to happen? Uh, what's said is that a strange idea came into Harry's head. Now, I hear somebody mumbling, it doesn't matter. But it does matter if there's no conceivable way for this to occur, and if the author's just asserting it, it's my right as an author to make whatever I want happen. I think it's this is just simply clear. not credible. I yeah, think it's right. fairly clear what's going to happen. All of these women have uh, gone to all the expense of buying this lavish dinner and preparing it for this man who's coming into the house, and then they take the widowed mother and put her on the throne of the couch and set her up. She's the gift. They're going to marry off this man that he's bringing into the house to the widowed mother. And they're as much for it as Harry is. Maybe they understand more about this than even the hero does. Even Stanley has a certain consent in him to this, doesn't he? I think so, yes. Fear in him. He'd like to be better fed. He'd like to get away from, uh, from the landlady where he's living. Could I say that, and that, that really cinches the case for his irresponsibility. He's even irresponsible to his fellow men. He's not... But, but irresponsible yeah. men aren't bad men, you see. Well, I don't think uh, that, you know. Survival is well, damning somebody for his inability to cope with the situation. And, and finally, the way he does cope with it is not really a, a moral one. It's, it's kind of a, a devious and sly uh, yeah. way to get around. But nevertheless, sure we, we have co I have great compassion for, for Harry because, gee, there's just really no other way Harry can do anything but to enlist an ally. And Stanley is just the natural choice. Uh, I, I think I disagree with uh, the cast of irony that you would like to place on the story because I feel that the author is in command of uh, the selection of detail and I felt that the detail of uh, Harry's arrival at this boarding house where Stanley lives and he is subjected to bowing down before the landlady and removing his shoes, that this was a detail chosen by the author to illustrate uh, his concept of men's position uh, relative to women. Uh, do you feel that the style of this particular story is well suited to the subject matter? Or, John? Well, at times it isn't, at times it isn't. It's a homogeneous style, and the subject matter is homogeneous. Witness. You have seen something of what we try to do with the program in creative writing at the University of Iowa. What we do could not be done unless we kept the imagination central and unless we created a community possessed by an intense ardor for the arts, possessed in the old-fashioned meaning of the word as if by a demon. In the arts, there is no other way. R.V. Castle is presently writer-in-residence at Purdue University. This is NET, the National Educational Television Network.